When we talk about rain, we don't speak of a single drop. Rather, we refer to the downpour, or shower, or drizzle, of the collective, innumerable drops, all unified by their place in the water cycle at a given moment in time. Like any given water drop, we've come a long way, and we've traveled together. And we're still on a journey, still carving out channels and pathways. We come up against obstacles, we get caught up in a current, but we move forever forward. If someone asks you where you're from, you might say your neighborhood, your town, your city, your province. Would anyone say their watershed? Would anyone announce the aquifer they reside above and draw their groundwater from? Is water that readily part of our identity? Hi, I'm Julie from the Millstone River Watershed, Aquifer 167. When we all know our bodies are made up of water, our economies rely on water. A lot of our joy comes from water. Our health, our prosperity, our happiness, water. But it's not an abstract concept. It's readily flowing and actively moving through everywhere we go and everything we do. And I believe a sustainable water future, which means maintaining water quality, water levels, and water's access, as well as water's spirit for our communities and the ecosystems that we enjoy for that collective benefit. This hinges on our ability to collaborate at the watershed scale. So we have to start thinking and seeing like a watershed. So where are we right now? Well, we're in the sub-watershed of Cary Creek, which is part of the Romney Creek watershed, which is within the French Creek water region, which is next to the Englishman River watershed, which is where our tap water comes from. So I can see why people just say car stuff. But if we start at the top, if we start at the top of the watershed, we'd be on Mount Arrowsmith, looking east towards the coast in the vast basin below. We'd see trees and lakes, river valleys. We'd see the highways, the built-up areas, and the Salish Sea. We wouldn't see municipal boundaries. We wouldn't see property lines. We just see topography, physical geographic features. Up here, it rains more, two to three times more than the coast we look east towards. And there are bigger global forces at play, influencing weather patterns that arrive and unfold within our watersheds. How much precipitation? When does it arrive? How intensely does it fall? How long does it last? Is it rain? Is it snow? As water travels down the mountainside, it is gravity and geology that largely determines its path. Some will soak into the soil and further infiltrate into the aquifers below. Some will be taken up by plants' roots, and some will travel on the surface into our rivers and creeks. Along its journey, water can get diverted off its path and put to use in the home, the farm field, or the industrial operation. In its cyclical and downgrading journey, water intersects so many users that rely on it deeply, and it comes into contact with many potential influences on quality. Water, by its very nature, connects. It connects the upstream to the downstream, the above ground to below ground. It connects the people that rely on it to the ecosystems that require it. Water connects the past to the present having flowed in these river valleys since time immemorial, giving life to the communities of First Peoples on the island, and to salmon, to trees, and it does to this day. Its abundance can have us complacent, its scarcity can have us anxious, its excess can have us panicked, and we experience all of this in Vancouver Island, on the East Coast. We have wet winters and dry summers, potential for flooding in the fall or spring, and we all want clean, accessible water, no matter if we are young or old, farmer, fisherman, forester, well owner, or city water customer. And there are innovative technologies that help us pursue and maintain abundant water in our growing communities. There are great water reuse systems, sh shower to toilet installations, that can save up to 30% of indoor water use by recycling. There's water filtration, 
such as the new water treatment plant going in here in Parksville, which will filter English and river water using membrane filters with the diameter of 1 600 the diameter of a strand of human hair. There's water monitoring equipment, such as a new weather station that went in at 1,300 meters on Mount Aerosmith to collect real-time data on precipitation, snow depth, snow water equipment, and send that data via satellite telemetry to publicly available websites. So technology you know, gets us a long way towards managing our impact and interaction with water, but it doesn't get us all the way. Innovative collaboration on water, coming up with novel ways to work together on water issues, creating new ways of organizing within our communities, this is what will help us implement that technology in a meaningful way that connects people, that successfully protects that which gives us life for the long term. If we are not working together at the watershed scale, we risk fragmenting our efforts instead of stitching them together. We want to leverage the success of others and each other to achieve that common goal of a prosperous water future. I consider this interaction I had about six years ago. I was doing some door-to-door -door outreach with Team WaterSmart here in Parksville, and we were checking on residential outdoor irrigation systems. Residents could voluntarily sign up to have us come visit their garden and check out the irrigation system, advise on ways to improve efficiency, schedule their run times, catch leaks, and so forth. It was a popular program that helped many residents happily save water. But I remember an elderly man walking around his garden with us during one of these such visits, and he started cursing the weeds coming up in his lawn. I just sprayed them with weed killer this weekend. Gosh, they're a pain. My coworker at that point asked if he was interested in learning about some natural alternatives to chemical pesticides, ready to launch into some suggestions. But the man abruptly said, no, I'm not interested. My colleague continued, but what about if your grandkids want to come play on the lawn? Wouldn't you be worried about the chemicals? The man asserted, much to the shock of us young Team Water Smart outreach workers, I don't have grandkids, I'm old. I'll probably die soon anyway. I don't care about chemicals. I want a perfect lawn. Literally. You know, it really struck me that this person did not view the world as we're all in this together. Rather, it seemed to me that he saw it as everyone for themselves, selfish pursuit of image or status at the expense of others in the environment. So, some vinegar-based recipe for a natural alternative uh, to eliminate this interruption in an otherwise uniformly green lawn, not going to be the answer with this individual. But what about the community as a whole? If there are no grandkids to care about, would people be compelled by fish and their well-being? I mean, what compels people to care about their impact on something as fundamental as water quality or water quantity? My pursuit of this question has led me to the importance of participation and collaboration. However, there's another swing to the pendulum where people do care, they are passionate and active, but have misplaced blame and anger as their focus. They work in isolated groups that don't foster cooperative solutions, but would rather cling to simplistic dichotomies about cause and effect, and don't seek to learn a nuanced approach that listens to the realities of the various actors in a watershed. So it's not just about how to compel people to care. It's about how to compel people to work together on solutions. And I think this could be done by creating a watershed identity that's shared within our community. Working together is slow. These other folks, they just don't get it. It's taking too long. We don't want the same things. These are some excuses I hear when there's resistance to collaboration. As the old adage goes, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Sustainability really means our capacity to exist in perpetuity, in harmony, without damaging that which gives us life. That's a lot for an individual, one group, one organization, or one agency to deal with alone. So how can we collaborate on water sustainability? I'll give you some local examples. In 2011, the regional government, local streamkeeper volunteers, the Provincial Water Quality Division, private timber company, 
all work together to address a problem that no one group could or would do in isolation, or could, could do in isolation. There's a glaring lack of water quality data in our local creeks and streams. And without water quality data, it is very hard to track trends in stream health, to understand if climate changes or land use practices are impacting our waterways. And if we don't know their status, we cannot effectively intervene to improve the situation if needed. So, through innovative collaboration, the province provided training to stewardship volunteers who offered their time in collecting data on our local creeks and streams. The regional government coordinated the effort, obtaining and distributing the sampling equipment, and entering the data into the provincial database once it's collected. Then it's analyzed and reported on by the provincial biologists so that issues can be identified and addressed by all parties where needed. The forestry company offered access to the land, safety equipment, as well as sponsorship funds for the data analysis. With this level of collaboration, over 50 sites on about 25 streams are now being monitored, some of which have as much as six years of data and the program is still ongoing. The data has helped direct efforts for stream restoration and watercourse protection. And further, these efforts have involved students from schools nearby to creeks and streams to help with streamside plantings, count salmon, and do photo monitoring. So collaborative participation in learning about local water resources, what it's really done is build trust. Trust in the data, trust in the people with the different jobs and responsibilities in the watershed. Trust in being heard and sharing influence and finding common ground. When people feel a part of something bigger, when they know their actions contribute to a greater purpose, they feel more compelled to act. They will take more responsibility for the outcome. Maybe that's what was missing with the old man and his lawn. Maybe if he thought about his lawn and his property within the context of the watershed that he lived in, he would see we're all in this together, all connected by flowing water, whether we like it or not. If we look at water as something that is purely utilitarian, we are prone to being selfish. But if we regard water with reverence, we're more likely to be stewards. If we view it as inextricable from our notion of home and where we're from, then pride and responsibility may follow. I recall the first field trip that I organized with forestry, partnership, and uh, municipal water purveyors to take a group of grade five students up to see uh, where their drinking water came from in the upper Minam River watershed. And it was a bright day in May, and for up to 30 kids, they were getting away from their desks to see where their tap water comes from. Up in the mountains, it was cooler and damper, and the bus ride to get there was bumpy. But as the kids poured off the bus to see Jump Lake Reservoir, their eyes widened taking in the view of this giant body of water high up in the mountains. The spillway from the dam was streaming with clear water that tomorrow would be flowing from their taps and into their water bottles. The innovation there was working with the forestry vine owners as partners and getting students out of their classroom to see and connect with their water source. And collaboration with the forestry landowners extends beyond just these field trips to joint monitoring initiatives, roundtable discussion participation about watershed values and how they must be protected by joint efforts. Collaboration at the neighborhood level has seen local residents working together to promote water efficiency by displaying watershed-friendly yard signs, where folks have engaged in water smart gardening by letting their lawns go golden, collecting rainwater, planting native species, and so forth. Neighborhood garden tours have been organized by keen residents with this focus, and this continues to inspire others. Further, collaborative processes should be built in as part of the way our organizations operate. We have a good example here locally, with our regional government having developed a fully regional service that includes the municipal areas, so the urban and suburban areas, as well as the unincorporated rural areas, in a program that talks all about water education, water data collection, and water policy and planning. This demonstrates, this approach here, demonstrates the recognition about the connectivity between the upstream and downstream communities. 
the shared surface water that flows through them, and the shared groundwater that collects in the aquifers beneath them. This approach provides a framework to design our policies and plan our communities using a watershed lens. And innovation and collaboration between the province and the regional government here extends beyond the stream monitoring example. It goes beyond to programs around groundwater protection, well owner education, and evidence based policy decision making. The province may be the decision maker in most cases, but the innovation at the local level is the active acknowledgement that if we have better local water information through monitoring, research, and studies, and if we funnel that information to the provincial decision makers, then better decisions will be made that affect our local communities, and that will help lead us towards a more sustainable water future. So if I could go back six years and chat with that same old man on his lawn, I would invite him down to the local creek, maybe Shelley Creek here in Parksville. I'd see if he'd want to check the small trucks that have been set in the creek by local stream keepers who are monitoring for fish. Maybe if he saw a baby coho salmon, if he saw the life that existed downstream, maybe something inside him would stir. But if it's too late for him, at least the students who've been on field trips to the drinking watershed and have helped with streamside, local, local streamside planting, their experience gives them context. They know what watershed they're in. They know what watershed their drinking water comes from. They know the fragility, the resilience, the importance. There's reverence. There's a sense of home. What if the, what if the watershed we lived in, or the aquifer we draw water from, was more readily part of our identity? What if it became more of a recognized part of who we are? That we're all in it together, with everyone else who shares this water source, or crosses paths with the same water. So where do we go from here? What we need more of as we continue to innovate in our community and reconcile our watershed identity is meaningful and unprecedented levels of collaboration with First Nations in all areas, but particularly with regards to water. It is a fundamentally spiritual element and important to First Nations culture, part of their rights and title associated with their traditional territories. True innovation would be authentic collaboration with Indigenous peoples on water sustainability, on their terms, with their influence. Working together on solutions, we harness the ideas, perspectives, and creativity of many. How can you be a part of it? We'll join street keepers, start a neighborhood water smart garden awareness tour. Think about the actions in your backyard and how they affect the watershed as a whole. Water is uniquely capable of bringing people together. We all need it to live. It's irreplaceable and interwoven into everything we do. So just like raindrops in a cloud, like water drops in a lake, we are unified by being together in the same watershed at this moment in time. So like water, let's move together on our path forward. Thanks very much. <laughs>